Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to all the participants for this uh, final session. So uh, this session is titled Lung Image Segmentation Using Machine Learning uh, Approaches. The uh, First, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Raghavendra Selvan is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the machine learning section at the Department of Computer Science and Data Science Lab of uh, University of uh, Copenhagen. Raghavendra has uh, obtained his PhD in medical image analysis from the University of Co Copenhagen and he has obtained his master's from Chalmers University, Sweden. So his current research interests are uh, broadly pertaining to Bayesian machine learning with a focus on medical image analysis, graph-based learning, tensor networks, approximate Bayesian inference, and Bayesian tracking theory. Apart from this, uh, Raghavendra has volunteered for uh, the Free Software Movement uh, Karnataka in uh, various roles. He is also a columnist. Uh, he was also a columnist for Hindu and Frontline. Okay. So uh, with this, I hand over uh, to the speaker, Raghavendra. You can take over. All right. Um, okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Prabod introduced, me, I'm uh, Raghavendra, so I think um, um, here everybody calls me Raghav, and then uh, Prabod would call me Raghu or however. So, um, yes, so I'm, um, yeah, so I think Prabod actually uh, did everything in terms of the introduction, uh, but I'll just kind of very quickly. Um, kind of uh, talk about my current affiliations again. So I'm a postdoc at the University of Copenhagen. Um, and then I do mostly research related to medical image analysis. And my PhD was in medical image analysis related to uh, chest X-rays, uh, uh, CT scans. So I studied volumetric uh, X-rays um, of chest to study the airways. So kind of my expertise is using automated image analysis methods to perform analysis on uh, chest or volumetric data. And now that we know as to why we are doing this webinar, right? So uh, in the sense, it's, it's uh, we are all say quarantined and then we are having to work from home and then the reason being uh, COVID-19. So with uh, this pandemic happening, there's been a lot of attention uh, on you know, automated machine learning based analysis to expedite research in this front. So I'm going to kind of give you like a broad overview of um, some of the work that is happening. Uh, of course, this is going to be like an hour long talk, so I don't think I can do an exhaustive, uh, uh, you know, overview. So just some key insights, but also leading up to some of the recent work which uh, you know we've done in my group so to do to be able to do that i also have to bridge some basics so that's going to be sort of the overview of this talk now what am i uh, talking about so if you've paid any attention to um, yeah, you know media there's a lot of hype about how ai is going to help us with uh, doing you know uh, covid related research now, what I'm mostly interested in is image-based methods, wherein images are, you know, chest X-rays or volumetric scans of your of the chest. And then you want to see what is the extent of infection, and then depending on this, can we say if the patients need, you know, ventilation support or if they have to be admitted to the ICUs. This is not sort of being done. The conventional way right now is to kind of use clinical measurements where. You know, a lot of tests are done and then we use that information but uh, a more easier relatively easier approach uh, could be uh, you know to have like chest x-rays taken these are uh, less expensive uh, and then very quick to process and then if we are able to identify what we call as markers meaning any indications in the chest x-rays then we can uh, you know maybe inform better clinical decisions for the doctors and then uh, help in the downstream tasks now hopefully through this task I will uh, through this talk I will try to give an overview of some of the methods some very basic tasks and then like lead into like yeah, you know some of these methods which 
can solve uh, some of these problems and then have shown uh, you know promising results. Now here is just sort of like an overview of a lot of methods. Uh, I will try to share these slides again you know, like in a PDF version with Prabodh, and then you can take it from him so that you have hyperlinks and things like that. So this is sort of, again, I'm just giving you uh, an overview and the acronym I'm using ML, I assumed everybody would know is machine learning. So, and MIA is medical image analysis. So that's sort of the broad overview of this talk, but I'm going to focus it for lung analysis uh, because we are in this COVID uh, times. So what do, you, what do I mean by image analysis now? Uh, here for also I mean automated image analysis, right? So using like a you plug in uh, the images, image data to uh, a computer program, and then you want to perform different tasks. Now the most common tasks are classification and then re regression, segmentation. I'll try to kind of quickly give an overview of uh, what each of these tasks are. So what is a classification task? Now you give. Uh, uh, two, say, uh, or not just two, you give like uh, chest x-rays to a model, uh, and then we want to sort of uh, reproduce the behavior that a doctor or a clinician would do. So what do they do? They take a scan and then look at the scan and then try to make sense of it, and then say if there is a problem or not, right? So now the problem could be, in this case, uh, I have, it, it's not doable as yet. Like, I mean, there are models which claim to do this, but there's no established uh, sort of result on if it is good enough to use in the clinics or not. Uh, so for instance, if you give a scan to a particular model and then you want to say if the patient is infected, uh, you know, with COVID or not. So now if you go on the internet and then like, you know, look at a lot of literature right now. So there are several methods which claim to do this. Now, uh, how do they do it is, I think, sort of, we will try to get like a small insight into that through this task. But basically, uh, the classification is when you want to say like a binary label, yes or no. So in this case, yes means COVID, no is no COVID. Or you want to do it like for pneumonia, for instance, or I'm going to keep it all focused on chest x-rays uh, because that's also the domain that I work most with. So now what is regression? Regression is, uh, I think most of you are aware of uh, what you would do in a regression task. So instead of saying like a binary classification of either being yes or no, then you want to give like some continuous value to, uh, you know, this uh, prediction. So instead of just saying yes or no, then you want to say like how much of the lung is infected, for instance. Now, if you say pneumonia, Right, like if you, you if you say that okay, fifty percent of the lungs are infected, meaning then the respiratory the capability uh, the respiratory capability is reduced half. Right, so now these can also be very useful. This is I think more relevant now when you want to kind of um, give a uh, you know ventilation support, for instance, if if the yeah, you know lungs are yeah, you know, 90% filled with pneumonia sort of, uh, uh, you know, scenario, then you want to, you know, then support them with ventilation or uh, things like that. So regression is basically where you can have like this continuous valued support prediction. Now segmentation, I think I will focus a bit more on this, uh, this again, because I work with this. So I, I work with segmentation of uh, chest X-rays uh, and lung data basically. So what is a segmentation model? Uh, so you take your input, which is uh, the chest X-rays, and uh, you plug into the model, and then you want to be able to, say, isolate only the lung regions. Now, why is this useful? This, you know, just by itself obtaining, if you see the, the bottom results, the binary, the black and white result, that basically what we is called the lung mask, meaning all the white regions correspond to the lung region, um, and then the rest of it is not, we are not interested in that. So when you want to study like a respiratory disease, you might want to focus, you know, most of your analysis on just this part, right? On just the lungs. So uh, this uh, is, is a useful sort of an intermediate step if you can just uh, focus only on the lung regions. So segmentation is basically the task of uh, splitting your image into meaningful partitions. Now, what are the regions here? 
the lung region and then the background region we would call. So now this is uh, sort of the intermediate step, as I said. Uh, in the pipeline, if you want to build like an automated uh, you know, machine learning algorithm, which you want just to focus within the lung region and then perform different sorts of analyses. Then there's another called registration. Uh, registration is basically the task of aligning images. So now why would this be interesting? Say, for instance, a patient is admitted to the hospital with initial early symptoms of COVID, and then every day there are like scans taken. So if you take successive scans on a daily basis, and then you're giving some treatment, you want to be able to see if the, you know, say the lung infection is improving or if it's deteriorating. And to be able to do this, you want to take like, you know, successive images uh, through every day, for instance, and then compare them. And then to do this comparison fairly, you want to first align them and then see which region has improved or which region has deteriorated. So this process of taking like two images, which are kind of the same, right? Of the same patient, for instance, and then aligning them is called registration. So now we will not be talking about these, but if you just start doing any bit of image analysis, these are the basic stuff. You start with something like classification and then regression, segmentation, registration. Now with more of these uh, natural language processing models. So we, we're also doing a bit of, uh, you know, captioning and things like that. So what does that mean? So um, for instance, if, if you have used Google Translate, I'm assuming most of you have. Uh, so it's a, it's a natural language processing model, meaning natural language is what we speak in. And then uh, natural language processing is sort of the subdomain in, uh, yeah, computer uh, and language understanding where you want the computers or the programs to understand our language, right? So now in NLP, what we basically would do uh, that the natural language processing is, for instance, you want, in the end, you're not interested in like saying, looking at the image and then saying what is happening where, because that's not what doctor does, right? So when you go to a clinic, um, and when you go to a laboratory, so you get your scan and then you get a report along with that, right? You don't, it's not very useful to just look at the scan, but then you have like a radiologist who looks at it and then makes comments about saying like, okay, in the right lung, there's this amount of infection in the left lung, in the left lower lobe, there is something going on here, etc. So you want to go from directly the image to the report. Now, this is also tried and then, you know, there are some interesting works going on there. So now that's called, uh, you know, you would do that with uh, uh, language models where you take the image inside and then try to, the model would then try to learn from the image and then report in text format. Now, uh, the last thing which I also have some interest in is uh, generation. Uh, these are called generative models, meaning you can synthesize new data now, this has a lot of uh, use cases, but I mean, I will not get into the details of it. Uh, so you can do this for um, what we call uh, data augmentation, and then you can do, uh, I think towards the end, I have like one of my recent works where we use this generative models in a very, um, I think, interesting setup. So we will get to that. So generative model is basically where we generate synthetic data. So you can make new chest x-rays now if you give it a bit a bit of thought you'll be like why is that interesting but it's it's actually very interesting so for instance here sort of like there's a quiz uh, i think i'm going to also like look at the chat now so there are like these five images here um look at them and then like which of these are uh, fake so just write type out the numbers uh, of what do you call or yeah you can just type in which of these images you think are real or fake all right so let's see i'm going to give you like 30 seconds and then i'm going to look at the chat here is um yeah if you can uh, type in and then let me know Okay, I see some results coming, that's good. So type in, uh, like I'm gonna give like another 10 seconds. So which of these images are uh, real or fake? So, okay, so I think I asked you to say which of these are fake. 
So I'm uh, assuming if you don't mention it, I will uh, think that you are calling those as the fake ones. Okay. Raghavendra, you can see the comments, right? Yes, I can. I can. Thanks. Okay. That's nice. I will get back to the slides now. Um, so actually all of these are fake images. So that's kind of the trick. So this is generated from one of these machine learning algorithms called uh, a GAN, a generative uh, adversarial network. So all of these are synthetic images. So these, yeah, it's from this website. You can go and later check it. It's called this person does not exist.com. It's, it's sort of like a nice, uh, funny exercise to just see what are these generative models. And then you can use them for, uh, you know, when you want to anonymize data or while still retaining some bit of features, et cetera. So now, so this is sort of like, yeah, it's, it's not very related to what I'm uh, going to talk in the rest of this uh, talk, but just to show where the models have come. So if you've heard of deep fakes and things like that, you know, these models are capable of uh, really generating photorealistic, uh, you know, images. And then if you look at lung scans, for instance, you can also make them look feasible. Now, that's it's a whole debate and then a domain by itself as to what this means and then where they can be used. But there's a it's called unsupervised learning and if you are interested yeah start uh, looking at these uh, generative models for that task okay so now going from the most uh, advanced sort of a model to we will try to do some very basic you know model because i want to introduce some terminology and then the basic paradigm of doing machine learning so i think to be able to do that uh, yes you can use the slides and then uh, look at them or pause the video at some point uh, but I will try to do like I'm assuming this is an engineering, uh, you know, audience. So we'll do a bit like like a couple of equations here and there. All right. So in classical image processing, so this is again classical meaning it's not sort of uh, old, but something which does not do machine learning. So everything that is not sort of uh, machine learned is now uh, lumped together as classical image processing. This is, if you've taken like a course on digital image processing, this is what you would do. Basically you take your input data and then you do some bit of pre-processing and then what we call feature crafting. Meaning if you're interested in sort of, uh, you know, going from the chest X-ray to the lungs alone, then what you would do is basically look at the, the chest X-ray and then think of, okay, if I want to get like the lung out of it and then the lung has a particular shape, so then you, or it has, if you look at the scan, right? So lung regions are darker because chest X-rays are basically, uh, they capture the attenuation and then lungs have uh, only air in them. So there's not a lot of attenuation going on. So they look darker than when you compare the bones, for instance, the rib cage. So now you can use all of this information and then say like, okay, I'm going to look for dark regions in the images. Uh, in the center of the image, then that perhaps will give me like, you know, a good approximation of where the lungs are. And then you know how the shape is. It's, uh, you know, it's sort of like a lung shaped, right? So you can introduce all of this information into the model. Now, this is called feature crafting, where you think about your task and then say like, huh, I'm interested in lungs, which are dark and then they have a particular shape and then they are in the center of the image and then there are two of these. So you you know, you build like a logic out of it. So, and then you make decision rules. And this is sort of the classical way of doing image processing, where you think of what you're trying to do, and then you encode that in a bunch of decision rules. Now, if you've, uh, you know, done morphological operations and, uh, you know, uh, filtering and things like that um, in image analysis, that's, that's what it would be like classical image processing. Now, this is sort of just the paradigm as to how it is done. So you give like the decision rules and the data, and then your model, you know, outputs answers. So what happens in machine learning is you flip it. So what do you want to do the way like machine learning? Well, what is machine learning? It's like a very, uh, you know, very basic, but a complicated question. But one answer that I really like is that machine learning is learning from data. So you're, you're just given like a bunch of data and then you try to learn patterns, it's pattern recognition from data, all right? So how are classical uh, mesh, mesh, uh, algorithms different from machine learning? 
ones. So in machine learning, um, this is sort of like, again, a very small subset, but for the scope of our talk, I think this definition is sufficient. You don't tell what the decision rules are. You don't tell that, tell the model that it's looking for dark regions and then which look like lungs. So what you do is you give a bunch of examples of both the input and the output. So what you then say is like you, you give the question and the answer and then ask the model to figure out what the rules are. So now this means you have some example cases where you know what the answers are. OK, this is called labeled data. If you have done any machine learning uh, you know, courses, then this is labeled data. So if you have uh, labeled data, so meaning questions and answers, you plug them into the model and then you ask the model to figure out what the rules are. And then this is the training phase where you train the model to learn the rules. And once you have done that, what you would end up doing is take away, you know, you give new questions and then use the rules from what it has learned and then figure out what the answers are. So that's sort of the testing or the inference phase. So machine learning is basically where the model learns from data. All right. So you learn the decision rules from uh, data. And I think this is like a very nice way of thinking about it. If you have a task and then if you want to solve it, how, how would you do it? It's uh, mostly by, uh, you know, if you have like these labeled data, then you plug this in uh, to the model and then you ask the model to figure out the rules and then you apply these rules again on new data and then hope that the model has learned, you know, useful rules to work. All right, so now let's look at this in a concrete. Yeah, okay, before that, I would like to sort of formalize this machine learning notion. So, yeah, so I think this is a, a, a way of looking at it, uh, you know, so if you see the, uh, from a probability, I like to look at this from like, if, when Prabodh was um, mentioning sort of my interest, he did say that I do a lot of sort of approximate Bayesian inference and things like that. So I like to think of everything from like a probability density point of view. So now machine learning also can be treated like that. So now what you then have is like an underlying data distribution. So like um, the blue bimodal distribution that I show there. And then you, so this distribution is where all your, you know, if you take one sample from this distribution, then that can be one of your chest X-ray images. And then it has a corresponding answer. So now, we are always dealing with these unknown data distributions from which you know your data can come out. So what we do with machine learning is approximate this unknown data distribution with what I have here, P theta of X in the you know bottom right hand of the screen. So now what can this data be? I've shown some examples. So it can be X-ray images, it can be speech and audio, it can be molecules. So that's why machine learning, if you see, is going, you know, like sort of there's a lot of applications going on across different domains because the underlying philosophy is the same. If you have a bunch of data with, you know, sort of paired examples, questions and answers, labeled data, then you can plug it into these specific type of, uh, you know, models, which, uh, you know, not only deep learning, but then there's like support vector machines or, um, you know, KNN classifiers, etc. So all of these can learn like a lot of useful features. Uh, and then you're, in the end, you're just trying to approximate this data distribution. And, and this is sort of like the paradigm that I like to think of. And of course, the bullets on the top right, if you see, are uh, sort of the different classes of uh, learning, uh, you know, uh, methods. So one is supervised learning where you have the labeled data. So uh, again, labels meaning answers to the questions that you're looking for. So you already have some examples. So that's labeled data. Then if you have those cases, then it's supervised learning. Semi-supervised is when you have a little bit of, uh, you know, answers or half the answers, and then you want to still learn from that. And then there's reinforcement learning and online learning where you can constantly learn. Um, so then there's something called self-supervised learning. This is just like, there's a lot of uh, different paradigms. And then unsupervised is where you don't have any um, answers per se. You know, you don't have any labels. You just learn the data and then to learn the model, uh, model the data distribution itself. But 
is it, this is also if you've previously encountered these terminologies just to kind of you know put that in context if not what we are going to be discussing in this talk is supervised learning where you have a bunch of questions and then answers and then you want to learn stuff from that yeah so i think before we get to doing some sort of like a concrete exercise uh let me also see how we are doing on time we are almost uh yeah 25 minutes okay um so yeah so i think what the key idea about machine learning if you haven't you know sort of previously done any of it but have heard a lot about you know machine learning and ai is it's it's simply you know the task of learning from data it's about discovering patterns and then why has this sort of like really taken off now that's because there's you know storage has become cheaper computation has become cheaper so then you can discover like you know more complex patterns in like big data right and this has happened in the past 10 to 15 years right so like i think even uh, so I, I remember having like a pen drive which was uh, i don't know 256 mb and things like that now you can get like a thumb drive which is one terabyte which is like the moore's law and everything going on so because of that uh, you can use machine learning now because there's a lot of data and then cheap compute power so you can plug in and then discover a lot of patterns and this is sort of like why is it yeah you know this is one way is you know that's the way we learn right when you are like you know if you if you look at children when they are growing up you, when they are learning languages for instance like you never start with the, you know the alphabet or the grammar the way you would study in a textbook right so it's mostly you're learning from examples where they look at you know adults speaking or training them and then you learn from that or things like you know that fire is hot and things like that you learn from experience i think because you learn from experience, uh, that's uh, that's why it's it's a form of intelligence in some way, and then that's why people call artificial intelligence. I'm I'm not very comfortable with the terminology. What we do is machine learning, basically discovering patterns from uh, ML. But AI sounds cooler, and then uh, you know it's it's fine. <laughs> but we need to know what the pitfalls are. Yeah. So again, this is all the most important bullet point. The third one that uh, because you're learning from data, what you learn is what is in the data, right? So, for instance, if you are looking at um, now, if you see, there's a lot of uh, debate and discussion about uh, you know how data and then machine learning algorithms should be used fairly, and that's because you know if you look at models which are built in the U.S and then you come and apply that in India, it has, for instance, the demography, like if you look at just chest x-rays, right? So if you have like a model, which is trained on a lot of data in, in the US, for instance, and then you bring that model and then say like, hey, this model worked really great in the US, I'm going to apply this in India. So it may work, but the chances are that it might not work as well as it worked in, for instance, another country. Now, that's because the data that the model has learned from is very specific to a particular demography. And unless it's not taken into account, it will not be, uh, you know, working fine. And this is like a, a constant problem uh, in uh, making machine learning models generalize. And then the, the core issue in machine learning is generalization, where the model should do well on data that it has not been trained on. Meaning, like I said, you, you, if you've trained a model in the US, you want the model to work in India. And if it works well, then that's a good model. And the whole hunt in machine learning is to come up with good models which are generalizable. OK, so now I pointed out sort of like um, one of the most complex models with the generative adversarial networks. And now I think. Uh, this is something most of you might have come across at some point, but we will go to one of the simplest model and then build up from there. And I'm going to discuss a bit of linear classification. So what is linear classification? So if I give you like a bunch of data points and then linear is something, you know, in a straight line, right? So it has to be a straight line in uh, 2D or it has to be a, a straight plane in 3D. So it should not have any nonlinearities. It should be just linear. 
right? So we are going to look at that as the first example. So now we want to build, say for instance, look at data like this. Now, it doesn't matter what these data points specifically mean, but then you have two classes of data here, one which is orange and then one which is blue in color. Now, can you think of like a, what we call, a, if, if I were to say, draw a straight line in this plot, so that all the orange points are on one side and all the blue points are on the other. Can you do it? I think it's easily doable, right? So if you see there's like, there's a gap between the red, blue and the red, orange plot points. So I think a straight line might fit there. So if a straight line can separate, you know, these classes like that, then we say that the, the data is linearly separable. So for instance, like this, right? So now on 2D here, if the data is in two dimensions, right? If you see there's an X axis and then a Y axis, so two dimensions. And then you can use a straight line, which is actually one dimensional because it has sort of like uh, just two parameters, the intercept and the slope. So it's called a D minus one dimensional hyperplane. Don't worry about that. So the idea is that if you have a 2D data, you can use 1D plane, which is a straight line. If you take data in 3D, and then if the data is linearly separable, then you only need two dimensions. But uh, the, the, the key idea, if you don't want to think about dimensions and et cetera, is like, just think of this example. You have this data points here, and then you can draw a straight line to split the data into two, two halves, or not halves, two partitions. So now this is, you know, you can write this in a mathematical form. Now, don't get bogged down by this. This is sort of like just a straight line equation. If you, you've done in, uh, I think, your first semester of uh, engineering or um, in high school even, right? Like if you, what is the straight line equation? If you remember it is, I think what we study is like Y is equal to uh, MX plus B or something like that, right? Where M is the slope, then B is the intercept. So it's just a straight line equation, all right? And then the straight line equation can also be written in vector form, which is basically the dot product. So again, don't worry about the, this last form. So what, what I have here, where it's W0 plus W1 times X1 plus W2 plus X2 equal to zero is basically the straight line, okay? So all the points above, so all the points on this straight line will be zero right? That's why the equation is zero, right? Like the straight line equation is zero because all the points on that straight line are, you know, going to be on that line. So that's zero. And all the points above will have a positive value and all the points below will have a negative value. So now we are trying to make like a decision rule uh, for separating this data. Now that can then be written as this. So again, so what I have here is basically, you know, what we want is a, a decision rule. What you mean, what I mean by that is if you take an orange point and then plug it into this straight line equation and the result is greater than or equal to zero, then it is, you know, plus one, meaning plus one here can correspond to orange color, right? Like two classes. Plus one is just a label. So it can be, you can just call that as orange and then minus one as blue. Okay, so when is the class, uh, when is a data point plus one, or when is it orange? If it is above the straight line, and that's the equation I have written there, right? If uh, W, the dot product of the data point with the straight line is greater than or equal to zero, then it is orange. If it is below, then it is blue. Now that's the decision rule. All right, so this is sort of like your, the first machine learning algorithm, which is called a linear classifier. So this is usually what you would do is like, you want to learn how to draw the straight line. So then to do that, you will, uh, you know, take a bunch of training data and then figure out the straight line, which gives you the best result. And then with, with that, you have learned the model. Okay, you've trained the model. You've learned what the specific W parameters should be. And then when you get new data, you try to see if it fits well or not. So this is sort of like the training phase and then the testing phase. Okay, so this is sort of like, what we're trying to figure out is like, where should I draw that straight line? But then 
we can visually see it, but then how do we teach that to a model by doing this, you know, algorithmically? So, all right. So here, yeah, it's the same thing. You can write this the sign of, uh, you know, this dot product. So if the sign is positive, then it's orange class. If the sign is negative, it's the blue class. Okay, this is a very compact way of writing a linear classifier. Now, why am I taking you through this uh, sort of a simple but a bit you know tedious example? That's because we can write this like this. So if you see our data is X, right? So X is uh, in our example, it was two dimensional. It only had X zero and then X one. And you can scale it up to D dimensionals, meaning you can go to 3D, 4D, 5D, or some high dimensional space. And then each input gets one weight. Now, what is this weight? It's like the parameters of your straight line, right? So how, how do I have to weigh X0 and X1? So how do we do this? So this is basically the you know, straight line equation the dot product, right? So WTX is the dot product. And what is the dot product? If you know, if, you, if I give you two vectors, and then if I want you to take the dot product of the two vectors, then what you would do is take element-wise, you will multiply and then sum them over, right? And that's what is happening here. You take the input, multiply that with the weights element-wise. So X0 gets W0, X1 gets W1, XD gets WD. You multiply them and then you take the sum. So the dot product, what we have here, WTX is indicated until the sigma sign. Sigma is for summation, right? Uh, or sigma is for summation. So once we do that, we want to take this result and then pass it to another function, which gives you the sign, tells you the sign. If it's plus five, then it'll say the sign is plus. And then if it's minus five, then it'll say minus or whatever. So that we call the activation function. So now, so if you see the last line where I have h of x equal to sine of wtx is graphically denoted as we have here. You take the input, you compute the dot product with the weights, that's until the summation, and then you check what is the sign, that's the activation, and then that is your result. If it's plus one, then it's like orange class. If it's minus one, it's the blue class. Now, why is this important? Because this is the first neural network algorithm you will also, you know, I haven't used the word until now. I've been talking about machine learning and AI and deep learning, but neural networks are sort of the one class of say machine learning algorithms which have really revolutionized several domains. Now, perceptron learning algorithm, I, I'm sorry, I forget the first paper, but I think it is from the 70s uh, is where it was introduced. Um, and, and it is a very classical algorithm, which basically just does this. Now, why is it called the perceptron learning algorithm? Now, a perceptron is like a neuron in our brain, right? So it has um, basically, how does a neuron work in our brain? It is connected to several other you know, neurons and then if it gets a signal, then it fires up, right? That's the whole, it gets activated. Now, if you see here, we are trying to sort of replicate that biological neuron here. So it gets inputs from different other neurons and then it does some processing. And then if the signal is, you know, something it has to get activated, then it gets activated or not. So if you see now, you will see this is very similar to what an individual biological neuron would be this is where the whole and then the 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 algorithmic equivalent of a neuron is a perceptron all right so that's the perceptron learning algorithm and then the whole discussion about why are we doing neural networks just stems from this very simple case that you know we're trying to do something very similar to a simple single neuron you know now that's the perceptron learning algorithm now what is it then deep learning, deep learning is basically, you know, we go from here, which is very simple. You just take like one input and then compute the dot product and then take the sign. We just increase the number of parameters here. If you see the W's here are very, you know, simple, you know, only D. Instead, we take the input and then plug it through a really complex 
you know, model. Let's just skip through, except for notice the title. This is sort of my understanding of deep learning. Deep learning is a massively parameterized function approximator. You can approximate any arbitrary function. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can approximate any arbitrary function. It's 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 a, a now it just depends on how well you approximate, right? So now, and then the function can basically take uh, anything as uh, input and then give you like some corresponding output, and then you want to do that mapping. That function f is what you learn in deep learning. Now, for our example, we are interested, for instance, in lung segmentation. So then we want to learn a model which is f and has a bunch of parameters. And then you want to plug in a chest X-ray and then get the lungs out of it, and that's actually uh, a function that is uh, possibly you know possible to approximate using deep learning. Yeah. So now let's go from this simple perceptron, you know, the linear classifier, to our first deep learning model, what we call a multi-layered perceptron. Okay. So as the name suggests, we are going to use multiple layers. So what do we have here? The first is the input layer. Let's look at the first and the last. So you have the input and output, all right? And in between, you have something called the hidden layer because it's stuck between the input and the output, and then you can't see it because the input you can see, and then the output you can see, and then it's something in between. So these are called hidden layers. Now, each of this hidden layer is a uh, classifier that we had here. If you see, right, it has a summation and then it has a sign. So if you see here, you take, uh, I don't know if you can see the mouse pointer. Prabodh, can you see the mouse pointer? Yeah, we can. Okay, excellent. <laughs> so then if you see here, uh, the first block, you know, so you have uh, a bunch of input data points, right? X1 to XD they get here, this arrow means, uh, let me show you here, this arrow, right? Where X0 had like, you know, it was multiplied with W0, X1 was multiplied with W1, XD was multiplied with WD, and then we took a summation. That's what is going on here. So each of this edge here has a weight corresponding to it, and then you multiply that with these inputs, and then you do the summation, and then I have like an empty, you know, half of this uh, circle, that's because there's an activation function. As I write here, hidden layer with nonlinear activation. And then the nonlinear activation was in the linear classifier, it was the sine function, but you can change this to several other, uh, if you have done sigmoid functions, or it, it has to be just a nonlinear function, that's all. And I will not get into that because I can spend an hour talking about just those nonlinearities, but, the thing is, then what you do is you take your input data and then multiply that with, um, you know, a bunch of weights. So, and then you sum them, that's the dot product, and then push it through a nonlinearity. You do that for another and another and another. So this is a hidden layer with four neurons, we say. One, two, three, four. Okay. So this is the terminology now. And then you have the output neuron here where you do this computation again. So if you don't have this, it's the same as the linear classifier we had from before. If you have like an introduced a hidden layer, then this is a deep neural network already because it has the depth of one. Okay. So once you have this network, we do the learning from data thingy. So you take the input, and then you give the model, uh, you know, some random parameters initially, and then you ask the model to predict. And then you compute what the prediction is, and then you know what the real answer is, and then you compute a loss, and then you correct the weights. Now, this is the process of doing training and deep neural network. And then this process of training is done using something called back propagation. And again, I, I, I would like you to uh, you know, see this as a teaser for you know doing a lot of these things. Back propagation is uh, an implementation of gradient descent algorithm. And gradient descent algorithm is a way of optimizing weights of a function by descending along the direction of the gradient. So, so if 
but but then in terms of the architecture, you have the input layer and then the output layer, and then you have a hidden layer. Okay, so and then they all have weights. So you have weights W0 and then weights W1. These are the things you need to adjust to you know learn your decision function. Yeah, you can make them deeper. You know, so you can instead of having only one hidden layer, and you can have like multiple hidden layers, and then it gets deeper. And then these are called feed-forward neural networks, which are very common. They use they are also called as multi-layered perceptrons, and then these are my favorite, uh, you know, neural networks because they're very simple, and then they are, you know, really uh, flexible. So that's the neural network now. Here you have it with, um, yeah depends on how you would count, but then I would count this as has a depth of two, and then it has one output uh, neuron. So, so now if you, whenever you hear deep learning, you know, something like this is going on. You take like a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, input data, and then you plug them in through these successive uh, perceptrons, and then uh, train them that's the most important thing. You need to adjust these weights so that it learns the decision rule. And that adjustment happens with your examples that you have, the questions and answers. So you get, you predict, and then you correct the answer. And then that error signal is back propagated so that you adjust all these things, these weights. Okay. So that's basically, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the as far as I can think of the easiest way of uh, you know, getting into what uh, deep learning is. Now, but we are trying to do segmentation of lungs, right? We want to go from lungs to lungs. Now, you can do this using feed-forward neural networks also, uh, but I, yeah, there's there's a lot of other literature from computer vision and things like that where you can then end up seeing that feed-forward neural nets are maybe not the most useful because computer vision has always done filtering, right? So you can learn, like, uh, you can do a low-pass filter and a high-pass filter, for instance. Uh, that's one way, and then you can do uh, filtering of, um, you know, Gaussian smoothing to learn some interesting features, etc. So as a rich heritage of learning filters or using filters to solve tasks in computer vision. So the way... It, this is accomplished in deep learning. I think this was very, very important uh, transformation is uh, when convolutional neural networks happened. So now in the feed-forward neural networks, you don't have any filters. You don't learn any filters. You just learn weights. So now in CNNs, convolutional neural networks, you learn convolution kernels, we say. So what sort of kernel should you learn to solve this particular task? Ideally, I would like a filter which learns how a lung looks, right? So now that's what we do with a convolutional neural network. You take the input, and then in the end, you learn a filter which can filter out all the noise. And the noise for me is everything other than the lungs. So now that's a CNN. Now, there's a lot of literature which is, you, you should, I mean, these are, you should take up, uh, you know, several uh, days of uh, courses on this to, to really appreciate it. But then current, I'm go just going to introduce like one very commonly used network right now, which is called the UNet. If you see, it looks like a U and then that's the UNet. So there's a very funny tradition of calling uh, neural networks in uh, CNNs. So this is the uh, in, in the deep learning literature now. So the idea is basically you take the image and then you learn some filters at the highest resolution. And then you go down in resolution. So if you start with an image, which is say 128 by 128, you would reduce the resolution. You would go down and then make it 64 by 64 and then you learn another bunch of filters here, and then you go down into another resolution and another resolution, and then you do this. Now, this comes from like uh, our, our vision, right? Like if you look at something, you can look at it at a different resolution. So if you just like look outside the window now, you know, if you have the, the look at the entire panorama there, for instance, and then you can make sense of information at like, different scales. That's how our computer vision or our vision works, right? You can uh, process information at different resolutions to make sense of it. That's what we're trying to teach the models here. We want the network to learn 
information at different resolutions. And this is what CNNs are very, very good at. So they can learn filters at different resolutions. And then this helps us solve the tasks very well. And then uh, this unit is what is called an encoder decoder structure. So encoder basically takes an input level data and then reduces it to a really low resolution. And then decoder takes that low resolution and then you know increases it back up there. This is unit and it's um, used extensively in medical image analysis. And then if you are, I will see if I have uh, time to quickly go through the other talk, but, but yes. So now this is sort of a classical way of doing, and then I'm just going to show you one of my recent works. Like I think I'm presenting this work tomorrow at a conference. So, uh, so it's kind of very recent. And then we are using this for uh, some of the COVID related analysis. Prabhupada, I would like to switch the screen now. I am going to share a different screen. If I can. Um, start the one. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just going to share my entire screen and then we figure it out. As... Okay, so this is sort of the work. Uh, can you see the new screen now? Uh, probably... Yeah, okay. yes, yes, Excellent. we can see. So this is sort of an extension of uh, the, the UNet, sort of a network that I showed, but this is for when you have, uh, you know, in COVID sort of uh, uh, cases, a normal chest, x-ray would look like this you know you have dark regions where your where the lungs are clearly seen and when you have an abnormal chest x-ray cxr is a chest x-ray pneumonia is basically water filling in your lungs or you know phlegm filling in the lungs so that starts uh, you know attenuating more of the x-ray so if you see here right a normal chest x-ray you can see the right and the left lungs clearly here the the right lung is barely seen and then that's a big problem. Now, how do we solve this? And I kind of, in this work, what we do is we pose this as a you know missing data problem. We say that, okay, this data is missing, so how do we solve that? And then this is our model. Basically, what I mentioned before, the encoder and then the decoder, the unit, that's up here. And then we use something called a variational uh, you know, encoder here and try to fill that missing data. And this part is where I use the generative model. Because the data is missing, I need to synthetically generate it. And that's where the generative models, which I previously mentioned, comes into picture. So you see, like it, it's not for just synthesizing uh, photorealistic phases, but then, and then we show that, you know, we can go from an input image here where you don't see anything to something like this. Now, yeah. This is sort of just the results of some of the, you know, this is the column B is like a model that we compare with, which is the basic unit. And then model C is where our model is, you know, performing very well, you know, if we show it in numbers, et cetera. But, but this is sort of like, a, and this is the ground truth in column D. So if you think, look at like the last row, you know, this is barely, you can see anything here, but then the model is able to impute the data and then, uh, you know, go from uh, an image like this and then without making very many mistakes. But of course, all of these models have their own, you know, flaws and then uh, cons. But but I mean, this is extensively sort of, you know, not extensively, it is being used. So if you can see, if you want to try this out, uh, I will have the link and things like that. So it's on my GitHub page. You can, you know, the data, the models, the paper, everything is here. So you can, uh, you know, look at it. And then as I show here, if you have some chest x-rays, I mean, there's a lot of publicly available data sets if you're interested in computer vision and medical image analysis. So you can try playing around with them. Or if you want to use the data that I used, I'm also making that available here. And then you can retrain the network. And then it's, it's uh, all the results from the paper 
can be uh, you know reproduced here all right so i will go to this main slideshow then so in 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 summary i think i'm uh, yeah doing well on time so we have like you know these design based classical methods right in um, that use le learn filters like i want to uh, get a lung out so i want to design a filter which can give me lungs so but the, with machine learning, what we want to do is we want to flip that and then say like, hey, I don't want to give you the rules. Can you learn the rules? I will give you the data. And it is doable to a large extent, but then I've put that asterisk and that's because I warned you, right? Like generalization is a problem. We need to have good quality label data and then we need to have a lot of data. And then there's a lot of uh, you know nitty, nitty gritties there. But it's it's very useful to kind of uh, with with big compute now that we can do things like this and uh, perceptron is sort of the digital equivalent of a single neuron and then we looked at the multi-layered perceptron which is also called the feed forward neural net and they're very very powerful and flexible and i really like them and you can do um, uh, that's what i call mlps multi-layered perceptrons and then you can do, uh, yeah, training the model is done using automatic differentiation, which is uh, how you do the back propagation algorithm. And, and CNNs can uh, learn complex filters, as I showed, which can learn lungs, for instance. Now, if you're interested, there are, I would suggest, don't just, if you have not, don't have experience, of course, one way is to start playing around with it, but I would urge you to do a lot of these MOOC courses. There's plenty of resources now. I think a good course is by Andrew Ng. It's on Coursera. Then there's a free textbook now, deeplearningbook.org. And then if you want to implement stuff, then there's things on PyTorch and TensorFlow. There's a lot of tutorials there. And uh, yeah, if you would like to try out my other projects and things like that, I have most of them listed on my website. So with code and then the paper. So uh, you can try them and then, yeah, possibly write to me. I might not immediately respond, but if there's something interesting for me also, then I might respond. I think um, that's the end of my talk. I will uh, see if there are any questions and then we can try to do that yeah uh, so some of them have posted a few questions so let yeah. me share them with you okay so one question is may i know the sources of databases available for training purposes yeah so there's a um, for instance it's for, i would assume that this is the question for uh, this particular work uh, mm -hmm. And it is listed. It, these are, I think, uh, there's a website called Kaggle now, K-A-G-G-L-E. Um, I think I even show that in the slides. I'll go back and then show my screen. Um, this. So I think, yeah, for instance, here, the chest X-ray images you see here, I have listed. I will make the slides available. For instance, Kaggle.com, if you go there, there's a bond. It's basically a competition website for doing machine learning. So there's a bunch of data, and then you want to, uh, you know, compete, build a model which does well in that ranking. And then if you win, then there's a prize, et cetera. So there's a lot of data available there. And uh, also, like I think uh, there's a lot of uh, machine learning uh, focus on making all the data available. So I would urge you to kind of, if you are interested in a particular task, read up about it. And then most of the data sets are made available, not so much in medical imaging, but then a lot of the data are just publicly available on GitHubs and then websites like Kaggle. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, there's a related question again. I hope uh, this could also be on the same line. So just yeah, later. I think I would just say you should uh, try out a Kaggle uh, website and then yeah. or just read my my paper, for instance. I have uh, those are patient real patient data that I have used. It's from two hospitals, one from Shenzhen in China and then Montgomery in Canada. Those two hospitals made their data available. And then there's another called Chexpert, which I think is from US. And then they have like, I don't know, 200,000 uh, images or something from real 
actual patients, but it's all anonymized and things like that. So you can use that to, I think I might mention that expert in here, not this one, hold on. Um, yeah, the checks, checks net here and then checks. If you just read this paper, they also have made the data available. So, yeah. Yeah, so the next question, which is the most preferred learning model which has minimum prediction loss? So it would depend on what task you're trying to do. Um, so like I said, if you have a feed forward neural network and then if you have the task is segmentation, maybe that's not so good, then you might want to use something which has convolutional neural network in that. CNNs mm -hmm. are better for image uh, related tasks. If you have like speech, and then if you have some uh, time relation information, then you would use something called LSTM or recurrent neural networks, which can take like correlation mm -hmm. along the time axis into account. So it's dependent on the task, like for this one, I would say a CNN for image segmentation, a CNN with the encoder decoder structure, something like a unit would be the best one. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, one last, uh, okay, there are two more questions. Okay. So, the participant says that her research domain is medical IoT. Uh, she is asking is there any variable devices that monitor parameters related to lungs? I wouldn't know. It's not something that I'm um, an expert in. So sorry. Okay. Uh, well, one last one. How are the chances of picking suboptimal solutions handled? That's a good question. So um, I think the when you are doing optimization, so ideally you would hope that you always get to the optimal solution. Now with deep learning, that's there's no, no guarantee at all. Now, the thing with how do you overcome suboptimal solutions is that uh, one way could be uh, you, you know, start uh, from different initial points. So meaning you have multiple networks being trained and then you then can do something like a majority vote sort of a thing, right? So if you retrain the network, say 10 times, and then uh, seven out of those 10 times, it reaches the same solution, then that's like uh, at least a local optimum solution. So you then say like, okay, you do that. Um, but I mean, the, there's no guarantee at all. So you can't actually say that you always can reach the global optimum. So that's uh, not possible in these really high dimensional spaces but you can give like a confidence about how well you do so that would be a one, one way of doing it yes yeah, yeah. i think uh, questions? yeah we are done with the questions okay uh so let me take this uh, opportunity uh, uh, so we from the department of cse uh, sit tumkur I uh, would like to extend our sincere thanks for uh, Raghavendra for such an informative session. Okay, and uh, participants, we do uh, share this uh, um, materials. We'll take uh, take it from Raghavendra and uh, share it with you on the group or as a, uh, a comment on the uh, on the YouTube channel. Okay, so uh, Raghavendra, thanks again. No problem. Uh, all the best, everyone. See you. Okay, uh, so participants, uh, so uh, we come to the uh, end of our uh, webinar webinar series. Um, so because of you, this uh, event was a great success. So from uh, the department of CSE, I extend a uh, sincere thanks for all the participants uh, who have joined uh, us and made this event a uh, success. And uh, another announcement regarding the certificates. Uh, so so uh, the certificates uh, will be issued to uh, participants uh, who have filled the feedback forms uh, detailed uh, guidelines of which will be shared on the uh, group okay and um, uh, on both the whatsapp and telegram groups 
uh, we require some time to uh, handle all these requests so your certificates uh, uh, will take some time uh, we hope that uh, we, we can do it by uh, next four days okay and <clears throat> these uh, certificate uh, there will be two feedback links uh, shared one feedback link for this session and one feedback link for the overall session so please do fill in your uh, names properly in this uh, feedback forms uh, based on these entries we'll be uh, generating the certificates okay so detailed dis uh, uh, discussion on uh, who gets the certificate and all uh, will be posted on the groups so uh, thank you uh, thank you participants okay so we'll be shortly sharing the feedback links ಅಲ್ವಾ <laughs> 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 